going to be reading from Joshua chapter 21. I'm going to be finishing off the chapter today, if I can get this machine to open. <laughs> Joshua 21, verses 43 through 45. So the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. The Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers, and not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. And Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that uh, we can bank on your word, that it is sure. And I pray that uh, the faith of each one here would be stirred up and encouraged as a result of looking into this uh, section of your holy scriptures. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, when I was reading commentaries on this uh, section of scripture, I was uh, fascinated by how many of those commentaries were puzzled over the uh, definitive way in which it speaks of the victory that God had given to Israel in uh, this passage. And what puzzles them is that chapter 23 will clearly state that there are still enemies in the land and there are still pockets of Canaanites that have not yet been captured. And so there are liberals out there who will say, clear-cut contradiction. There is uh, a contradiction here. They love to make contradictions. But I was reading other liberals and even unbelievers who said, you know what, it, it just does not seem like it could possibly be a contradiction because this author four times has said the same thing and then in the immediate context has gone on to say, but there are still enemies in the land. So there must be something going on. And nobody's that stupid that they're going to say something and just a few phrases later uh, contradict themselves on that. So even unbelievers uh, have said, now nah, it's probably not a contradiction. Now, I'll give you an example. Chapter 23, verse 1 <clears throat> says, Now it came to pass a long time after the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua was old, advanced in age. So there it is. He's given them rest all around. And yet as you continue reading through chapter 23, uh, you see that there are still enemies in the land uh, that have not been expelled, verse 5, because they, quote, still remain among you, verse 7. And in verse 12, he warns them not to intermarry with the Canaanites who are still in the land, otherwise they're going to be thorns in their side. And he goes and he has other indicators that there is still more victory that needs to be uh, done. And so evangelicals have tended to land on two explanations. Some, like Calvin, emphasize that each and every promise of the land and conquest of the enemies was fulfilled when and only when Israel claimed those promises by faith and acted upon those promises. So it's talking about the promises that they claimed being fulfilled 100%. For example, William MacDonald interprets verse 44 of our chapter this way. He says, there were still enemies within the land. Not all the Canaanites had been destroyed. But that was not God's fault. He fulfilled his promise by defeating every foe against which the Israelites fought. If there were still undefeated foes and pockets of resistance, it was because Israel did not claim God's promise. Now, others are not totally satisfied with that explanation. They say there's still phrases in there that doesn't seem to 100% fit. And so they say that this passage is focusing upon the first stage of the kingdom that God had promised and yet it always anticipated there was going to be more. After all, God had promised originally that they was, he was going to dispossess them little by little over a long period of time. It's only been seven years so far. And so on this theory, they had claimed and possessed 100% of the boundaries God had promised during the first stage, and no more enemies were willing to fight. And there certainly seems to be an element of truth in that. After all, they didn't need the soldiers anymore from the east side of the Jordan. So we're going to see in the next chapter, Joshua was going to send them back to their homes. Uh, there had been sufficient victory that those armies were no longer needed. But there is a third, and I believe better explanation that incorporates both of those explanations, but adds a third element 
Uh, and it appeals to the book of Hebrews because Hebrews picks up this story quite extensively, actually. And it highlights the frequent concept of the already, not yet. If you've been reformed for very long, you've probably heard of that phrase, the already, not yet. It's found throughout Scripture. It emphasizes three stages in God's plan. The initial stage was when God gave the right and empowerment to see every promise fulfilled. And God gave that the moment Joshua crossed uh, the Jordan River. He, at that moment, gave them everything in the land, and he empowered them to possess everything, as they would claim it by faith. And so legally, in other words, positionally, Canaan was theirs. They had been given the land. The second stage is the experiential victory that was achieved in this chapter when every boundary promised was captured, and all of the enemies were subdued to a degree where they no longer were willing to fight. Uh, they were successful in keeping them under control. In fact, so thorough was this stage of victory that Joshua was able to send most of the troops who had come from the east side of the Jordan back to their homes in chapter 22. The third stage of the already not yet would be the end stage of Israel's future progressive Christianization of Canaan that they had captured, already captured, until every square inch of Canaan was eventually brought under the lordship of God, and this would have been during the reigns, uh, latter part of David's reign and the early part of Solomon's reign. So they point to the legal or positional victory that God announced the moment they crossed the Jordan, then there is the experiential victory they achieved in this chapter, and then there is the ultimate victory that it's found under David and Solomon. And they point out you know, this already not yet approach is used by God for several other things in Scripture. For example, take your own sanctification. Uh, there is an initial positional sanctification of believer the moment he is converted and given the Holy Spirit and given everything that he needs to be able to succeed in life. And uh, so complete is that sanctification that these new believers can be called saints the moment that they are converted. They still got a lot of baggage, but God calls them saints, right? And you hear Brother Gary calling you dear saints. Uh, that is your position in Christ. You are legally saints, set apart to God. The next stage is the growth of experiential sanctification that can result in such a level of maturity that despite pockets of indwelling sin that may remain, the person is said to be sanctified or mature or holy. But the ultimate sanctification of all believers only happens at their glorification on the last day of history when the last enemy, death, is conquered in the resurrection. And so there's positional sanctification, there's experiential sanctification, and there's definitive or ultimate sanctification on the last day of history. Now, using the same concept, Hebrews also applies these three stages to Christ's kingdom as a whole. When were all things put under Christ's feet positionally. Now, Hebrews says it was at the moment of his enthronement at, and his pouring out of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, his worldwide kingdom was established positionally in the first century. But despite Hebrews 2, 8 saying that God had already put all things in subjection under the feet of Jesus and that he had left nothing that was not put under Jesus, the very next clause says this, but we do not yet see all things put under him. And he goes on to say that it's only as the church obediently, by faith, advances the kingdom that the kingdom will experientially put down all enemies and Christianize the world. But even then, after the world is completely Christian, there's still one enemy left, death, right? Death is an enemy. And so scripture goes on to say that the last enemy, death, will not be conquered until the second coming when Jesus will resurrect all saints, renew the cosmos, and bring in the ultimate stage of his kingdom. And so there's an absolute sense in which Jesus defeated Satan and the world in his resurrection, was given absolutely everything in AD 30. There's the experiential advancing of the kingdom. There's the definitive or the ultimate stage of the kingdom. And so that in a nutshell, um, it's a pretty big nutshell, right? Is the already, not yet. And Hebrews uses this theology to point out that the church must walk in faith and do all in its power to experientially put more and more of this world under the feet of Jesus, and thus all of its warnings. And I want to read a sampling of warnings from Hebrews. 
Hebrews says, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Since, therefore, it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time, as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, for if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. Let us, therefore, be diligent to enter that rest, lest any one fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The point is, everything was put under Christ's feet in AD 30, and the church will put that positional victory into practice as they obey the Great Commission, make disciples of all nations, and then teach those nations to obey absolutely everything that Christ has commanded in the Bible. It's guaranteed this will one day happen, but it is conditioned to happen as the whole church has faith and stops making peace treaties with the world. Okay? And thus the book of Joshua is a wonderful picture of God's call to faith. It's a wonderful picture of the already not yet that the New Testament holds forth. Everything legally belongs to Christ, will progressively be taken by Christ's followers, and eventually when every other enemy is defeated, the last enemy, death, will be defeated in the resurrection when Jesus renews the cosmos and, uh, and ushers in the final stage of the kingdom. Okay, I know it's a long introduction, but I wanted you to understand the concept of the already not yet. And so let's look at each phrase of this remarkable paragraph. First thing we see in this paragraph is that we should never settle for anything less than what God has called us to conquer. Verse 43 says, so the Lord gave to Israel all the land. He didn't just give them some, he gave them all the land, and Israel should never have settled for anything less than seeing God's word lived out in every nook and cranny of Canaan. It's a huge vision. It's an impossible vision. That is, it's impossible apart from God's grace. By the end of David's reign and into Solomon's reign, there were no enemies left, and David's and Solomon's reign really is a typological picture of the glories that God still has in store for planet Earth in our future. But too many Christians are preoccupied with lesser things. Uh, I read a book that deals with raising our vision a lot higher uh, to a God-sized vision, and it told this parable. A police officer arrived at the scene of an accident before the dust had even settled. He found that a wealthy young man had been thrown out of his Mercedes just before it plunged over a steep cliff and crashed onto the rocks far below in a ball of flames. The young man was standing along the roadside at the top of the cliff, weeping. He was bleeding profusely from the stump of his shoulder, all that was left of his arm. My Mercedes, my Mercedes, the young man howled. You ought to be thankful you're alive, the amazed officer said. But it had $20,000 worth of options, the man whimpered, staring down at the burning wreckage. There are things more important than that stupid car, the police officer insisted, guiding the injured man away from the cliff. We've got to get you to a hospital. Your arm has been torn off and you could bleed to death. The young man looked down and noticed for the first time that his arm was missing. Horrified, he screamed, my Rolex, my Rolex. <laughs> now obviously it's a fictional story, <laughs> but I think it captures how shallow many Christians in the West have become. We are not captured with the greatness of the Great Commission. We've become captured with things of far lesser importance, and God wants us to claim all things for Jesus. But the next phrase in our paragraph is the first hint that not one square inch of the land could be taken apart from faith. It says, which he had sworn to give to their fathers. Why does he bring up their fathers? Well... He promised their fathers the same exact land that they had spent the, same, uh, the last seven years possessing, and yet their fathers did not receive one square inch of Canaan. Why? Deuteronomy 9.4 says it was because of their unbelief. 
Hebrews 3.19 says the same thing about their forefathers who had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and it says, so we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. And so God had sworn to give the fathers the land, but that promise was conditioned upon faith. Since the fathers lacked faith, God was not held to his promise. His promise was sure, his promise was certain, and it continues to remain certain and sure. The only question that slows down the yet part of the already not yet is the church's faith. Will we take his word at face value and live out, the, uh, live out that faith? Will we believe the greatness of the Great Commission? I think most Christians are satisfied with saving a remnant out of the world and making them Christians, but what does the Great Commission call us to do? It calls us to make disciples of nations, in fact, of all nations. Some people say, well, we've had some Christianized nations in the past, so there's nothing that hinders Christ's second coming, but that's not all nations, and there's more. Uh, the Great Commission not only calls us to... Um, uh, to win them to Christ, but to disciple them and to teach them to observe all things that Christ has commanded us. Has there been any nation that has 100% lived out biblical civics? I don't think so. Has there been any nation that has fully lived out biblical economics? I don't think so. Uh, so we've got a long ways to go, and we have to have faith that the greatness of the Great Commission is possible. God will not honor lack of faith. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But you know what? Any time that the church has had faith to conquer the nations like the Joshua generation did, incredible things have happened. And I've pointed out in the past that within 300 years of Christ, uh, the church had captured and Christianized more than 50% of the Roman Empire. That's just phenomenal. Why did they achieve that kind of growth? Well, it was because they had a faith to really believe that the Great Commission was possible. And even today, we see country after country where the church is aggressively advancing God's cause. And I've mentioned some countries in the past. I'm going to bring up a new country that I have not mentioned in the past. It's Iran. Iran is a Muslim country that many Christians in the past have believed would be impossible to convert because Islam is so impervious to the gospel, or so they think. Well, the church in Iran apparently does not think so. They've got a vision of making Iran into a Christian nation, and despite martyrdom and imprisonment and economic sanctions and other forms of persecution, they have set their sights on converting more and more. And in the past two decades, they have been so successful that many, many news reports have said they are the fastest growing church in the entire world. How successful have they been? Well, uh, in February of this year, a senior Muslim cleric in Iran publicly despaired that Christianity was taking over that nation. And he publicly stated that 55,000 of Iran's 75,000 mosques have had to close down because so many people have converted to Christ. That's a 74% reduction in Muslim mosques, right? Uh, one on the ground estimate is that one million Muslims in Iran have become Christian. And here's the point, the impossible is possible when the church embraces God's promises by faith and really acts upon those promises. Now what's happened in the West? the exact opposite. And the church is going backwards because their pathetic eschatology has killed their faith. Most in the West believe that things must inevitably get worse and worse. But anytime the church lacks faith, Hebrews says, church is not going to advance. We should not be surprised at all. So the previously Christian Western nations are now in a shambles. Iranian Christians have the faith of Joshua's generation. Western nations that have embraced pessimistic eschatologies have the lack of faith of the wilderness generation. We cannot break God's principle that the kingdom must advance by faith. And by the way, this is why, you know, some people say eschatology is not an important doctrine. I say, no, eschatology, post-millennial eschatology is a critical doctrine, it is a foundation for our faith and for our actions. It's a foundation stone. Now, the next phrase indicates that our sovereign God works through the actions of free agents. It says, and they took possession of it. 
James says that faith without action is a dead faith. James 2, verses 17, 20, and 26. When Christians are determined to take possession of the universities, the film industry, science, agriculture, and every other aspect of society, God will bless their efforts. And that's uh, what God had done with this generation within seven years. It really is a stunning testimony to faith that so many Canaanite nations, and they were independent nations, were subdued and Israel was able to occupy the land sufficiently that, as I mentioned, the eastern tribes, they were able to go back to their land and uh, take dominion. By the way, the eastern tribes had already 100% conquered their part of the, the territory, and they had been for the last seven years helping their brothers to conquer theirs. They were not passive. Now, let me quote from some commentaries on how divine sovereignty and human responsibility must be seen as going hand in hand. A.W. Pink says, they say that to press the sovereignty of God excludes human responsibility, whereas human responsibility is based upon divine sovereignty and is the product of it. D.A. Carson says, any theology that attempts to diminish God's sovereignty by appealing to human freedom is as profoundly unpauline as any theology that somehow diminishes human responsibility and accountability by appealing to some crude divine fatalism. And so God made it abundantly clear that without Israelites' actions of faith, the land would not be conquered, period. Well, in the same way, the Great Commission will not be fulfilled by us watching God do all the work while we sit on the sidelines. That's not faith, right? Another commentary said, divine sovereignty is not a substitute for human responsibility. God's sovereign word is an encouragement to God's servants to believe God and obey his commands. As Charles Spurgeon put it, Joshua was not to use the promise as a couch upon which his indolence might luxuriate, but as a girdle wherewith to gird his loins for future activity. In short, God's promises are prods, not pillows. And I say amen. And that is true with regard to prayer as well. John R. W. Stott says, we learn, therefore, that God's promises do not render prayer superfluous. On the contrary, it is only his promises which give us the warrant to pray and the confidence that he will hear and answer. And by the way, reformed people who have believed in divine sovereignty and human responsibility have been some of the most activist and faith-filled men and women of the past. And so to summarize the previous points of verse 43, make sure your vision is as big as God's vision. Don't try to have something that you can accomplish in your own strength. Keep it a God-sized vision. Don't settle for anything less than the full scope of what God has promised in the Great Commission. Second, have faith in God's promises. Don't doubt them in the least. Third, if you really believe God's promises, it will result in your attempting great things for God in the industry that you work in and the communities that you work in. Christians think that the goal of abolishing abortion is an impossible goal, so their goal is, well, let's ban abortion at 15 weeks. That's not a goal of faith. It is not consistent with the Scripture. We need to have goals that God has set for us, not goals that we make up on our own. And I would encourage you to uh, join with the God-sized vision that Jared Ridge is seeking to stir up for abolishing abor abortion. It's a God-sized goal. It's a biblical goal. It's a goal that requires faith, but I think it's the kind of goal that God loves to honor. Joshua is a call to expect great things from God and to attempt great things for him. We need to let him define our Christian life. The last phrase in verse 43 shows that God expects us to settle in for the long haul. It says, and dwelt in it. These weren't token victories. And yes, there was still a lot more that needed to be done. Everybody knew that. But Israel actually settled into the borders that God had given and began to take the actions needed to maintain those borders and devote everything within those borders to his cause. Now, would it take several generations uh, to bring everything under those borders uh, under the lordship of Jesus on God? Yes, of course. But they settled in for the long haul and had long-term goals. And we too must stop our short-sighted goals and strategies and tactics in politics, science, medicine, and other areas that are currently dominated by humanists. We must settle in with long-term goals, making everything that we touch thoroughly biblical. I don't think anything less than that is God-glorifying. 
and therefore nothing less will be blessed by God. Uh, you know, I've mentioned Ethiopia. It's just advancing like crazy. Why? Because I think they're taking the principles in this section here very seriously. But there's more. The first clause in verse 44 shows that they believed God owned Canaan and therefore had the right to give it. It says the Lord gave them. Canaan did not belong to Satan. <laughs> it belonged to God, and only God had the right to give that. We must believe that this is our Father's world, and he can give it to those who have faith. Do you have a faith that trusts God to give you America? John Knox is well known for his intense prayer, give me Scotland or I die. He had a God-sized faith. It was a faith, actually, that made uh, many people say, uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, tremble in her boots. Uh, she was scared to death, and God did indeed give Scotland to him. The life motto of William Carey was, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. And it's no wonder that he was able to accomplish so much in his lifetime. Say, he knew God owned all things, had the ability to give what he asked for. I think we give Satan way, way, way too much credit. This is not Satan's world. This is God's world, and we must claim it for God. The next phrase in verse 44 shows that God is willing to give us true rest from warfare after we have exercised true faith. It says, the Lord gave them rest all around. And this was not just theoretical. We've already seen that in the next chapter. All of the soldiers from the east side of Jordan were sent back to their homes, and they were able to enjoy life to some degree. They had, had sufficient um, a victory because of their faithful diligence that no enemy was able to resist them anymore. They were all holed up. They did not fight. Now, could they have had more success? Certainly. But God did indeed reward them with a degree of rest because of the degree of faith and diligence that they had. Well, let's apply this to our lives personally. Some people have fought against their sinful habits for so long that they despair of ever being able to achieve any kind of victory. But it is possible to gain victory over anger, over addictions, laziness, porn, any other besetting sins you have. We call this maturity. You can come to a place of maturity and rest. And when Christians don't have rest from those battles, I believe it's because they're battling the enemy in their own strength or with tools that are not God's tools or God's ways. Psychology will never give people rest like biblical counseling will. Using the world's tactics and politics will never give you the rest that biblical strategies will. God will not give the church in America rest until the church in America begins to let God define what still needs to be fought. And there is a ton that needs to be fought. We need to fight against socialism and evolutionism and the woke movement and secular psychology and compromised politics and statism and perversion in the film industry and everything else that is contrary to his word. We can't expect rest until the church diligently seizes what God calls us to seize. The next phrase indicates that our God is a promise-keeping God, and we should never doubt his promises. It says, according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And what had he sworn to their fathers? Had he told them that they were going to conquer Canaan in one day? No, absolutely not. Uh, Exodus 23:30 says, "Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. Even though it would be gradual, Israel would eventually possess the land. And in this chapter, the possession of the boundaries that was promised had been possessed. God kept his promises, and he promised more. He promised that eventually everyone within those boundaries would serve him and would follow his laws. Well, God promises us the same thing, and I want to read you some promises that you can bank your faith upon. Romans 16, 20. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Matthew 16, 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. 1 Corinthians 15, 25 through 28 says... For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet, but when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted, that is the Father. 
Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Colossians 1, 18 through 20 says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Romans 11, 25 through 26 says, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Isaiah 11, verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Daniel 2.35 Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Daniel 2.44 In the days of these kings... Excuse me, and in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Daniel 7, 27. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve him and obey him. Zechariah 13, verse 2. It shall be in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, and they shall no longer be remembered. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. He's saying he's going to eventually cleanse every demon off of the earth. Zechariah 14, 16 through 21 says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who was left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. In that day... Holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. <laughs> I mean, even the horses, you're going to see God's word. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. In that day, there shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. He's saying you're cooking. He's saying the combing of your hair, everything you're doing, you're going to do to God's glory. You're going to do consistently with his word. Jeremiah 31, verse 34, No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. There's coming a day where there won't be any more enemies left in the land. Those are tremendous promises, and yet how many Christians really believe them? It's my conviction that God will not honor a church that refuses to believe that his promises of total victory are possible in history. Matthew Henry said, God never promises more than he is able to perform. And this is why we believe the Christianization of the entire world is possible. God has promised it. And if that makes no sense to you, go study post-millennial eschatology. You're, you're going to be blown out of the water. It's going to increase your faith. But you also need to study God's remedies for your personal issues. Maybe you have other issues in your life that just seem impossible. Well, claim God's promises. Corey Ten Boom said, let God's promises shine on your problems. The last part of verse 44 shows that our conquering God is sufficient for our inadequacies. It says, and not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Now, if they had fought without the, the Lord, uh, the Canaanites probably would have given them a lot more trouble, but because God delivered them into Israel's hands, the Canaanites weren't able to stand against them. And God continues to be sufficient for all of our inadequacies. I love the way that Paul worded it in 2 Corinthians. He said, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Now, we may feel weak 
and inadequate to accomplish the huge task that God has given to the church, or even for ourselves, for our personal holiness. But as Jesus told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. If you feel weak, you're the perfect candidate for God's power to work through you, right? <clears throat> it's uh, his faithful character that is the foundation for our faith and the foundation for our victories. A.W. Tozer said, why do I insist that all Christians should know for themselves the kind of God they love and serve? It is because all the promises of God rest completely upon his character. Why do I insist that all Christians should search the scriptures and learn as much as they can about this God who is dealing with them? It is because their faith will only spring up naturally and joyfully as they find that our God is trustworthy and fully able to perform every promise he has made. Christians look at impossibilities and they get discouraged. Why? Because their focus is on themselves and upon their inadequacies, whereas the Scripture tells us to look to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the one that is faithful. He is the one that is dependable. And the more we see that, the more our doubts will begin to disappear. This whole paragraph at the end of chapter 21 is a remedy for discouragement and paralysis. The next phrase indicates that our God is a God who looks out for our good. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. Now, centuries later, Solomon picks up that promise, and he says, yeah, that's exactly right. He said, blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise which he promised through his servant Moses. 1 Kings 8, 56. When God gives commands or promises, they are always for the good of his people. Now, when you're in the thick of the battle and you're maybe experiencing some wounds and things, it may not seem like it is good, but God guarantees that he works all things together for the good of his people, even the painful things that we might face. And uh, we can make the sacrifices of serving him cheerfully, knowing that we can never outgive God. God is looking out for our good, and that frees us up to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. May we do so. The final encouragement in this paragraph are the four words, all came to pass. Our God is a God who fulfills his promises. And let's just apply this to our personal battles. Alan Redpath once said, in the light of the cross, is it not true that the enemy has no right to dwell in the land? Is it not true that Satan's claim to your life was taken from him at Calvary? Is it not true that sin has no right to a foothold in the life of the child of God? Is it not true that Satan has no power in the presence of omnipotence? Is it not true that by virtue of his blood and his resurrection, Jesus Christ is pledged to destroy the enemy utterly? Is it not true that in the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, there is strength for every temptation, grace for every trial, power to overcome every difficulty? See, when we put our faith in the promises of God, he will give us victory after victory. And what this final paragraph does is it shows us that the God who is for us is so great that we can, without any reservation, commit ourselves entirely to him. Now, in a moment, we're going to be singing a hymn called All for Jesus and making this our own personal testimony, saying, yes, Lord, this is what I'm committed to. This is what I want. But I'm going to read the words to you first to see if this can indeed be the response of your heart to what God has said to you in this sermon. The hymn says, all for Jesus, all for Jesus, all my being's ransom powers, all my thoughts and words and doings, all my days and all my hours. Let my hands perform his bidding. Let my feet run in his ways. Let my eyes see Jesus only. Let my lips speak forth his praise. Since my eyes were fixed on Jesus, I have lost sight of all beside. So enchained my spirit's vision looking at the crucified. Oh, what wonder, how amazing. Jesus, glorious King of kings, deigns to call me his beloved, lets me rest beneath his wings. May that be uh, the testimony of each one here. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word and the challenges that it gives to us, even the rebukes that it brings to our hearts. And I pray that you would forgive me and you would forgive any of us who drift away from a faith in your promises, who become easily discouraged 
who want to cry over things that uh, are not going uh, the way we think they should be going. Help us to have the kind of faith that overcomes the world. Father, I pray that you would bless this people with uh, your indwelling spirit and all of the power that Jesus purchased for us in the cross. Help us, Father, to grow and keep growing in you and never stop growing. Uh, help us to bring every aspect of our lives under the feet of King Jesus and every aspect of what we do in our businesses and uh, in the communities that we live in. Uh, bring them to you. We want to influence our culture for you. And we pray to that end, Father, that you would strengthen us and uh, that you would help us to uh, be in this battle for the long haul. In Jesus' name, amen.